All right, everybody, if you could go ahead and find your seats, we will get started with our final capstone presentation. Our next capstone presenter is Mr. J.J. Sassano. He is a senior mass comm major and self-proclaimed history buff. So y'all give it up for him and his capstone on historical inaccuracies in the media. Capstone presentations. My name is John Edwin Sassano, and my capstone presentation is on history and mass media and their relationship. First, the objectives. I wanted to improve my oration skills, and of course, this is what I'm doing right now, am I not? Next, I wanted to teach history, but I wanted to deviate from the typical classroom environment. I feel as though I feel as though many people disregard history through the classroom environment. They think of it as dull. When we, when we experience history so much, especially through mass media, and I want to help try and teach it, I want to try and be more focused on teaching history through mass media. Next, I want to keep writing. As a, as someone who's studying to become a journalist here at Piedmont College, I want, I, I like to write. I need to write prolifically in order to, in order to ensure my career as a journalist. Next, I wanted to edit video. I haven't had as many opportunities as I would like to edit video, and especially in today's age of digital media, video and, edit, and the editing of is ubiquitous and necessary in the job market. And this, and this capstone is giving me the opportunity to do so. Next, six deliverables. There were, one it was a 10-page research paper. Two was a promotional package. Three was a series of eight articles printed in either the published or either the print edition or the online edition. And the fourth deliverable was a series of 12 blog articles about my experience and about my capstone experience. Five was a panel event titled Historically Inaccurate. And number six was a recap video for those who missed the panel. My, my technologies were Adobe Premiere Pro. This was used to, ed to edit video footage that was used for the sixth deliverable as well as the, sec the second deliverable. Next, what, uh, next was Wix. This is a website building platform that I use to create my blog. Third was a was Adobe uh, Sony SoundForge, sorry, which is used to which is used to edit sound, and it, which is what we use to edit sound for the radio here at Piedmont College. And what radio station? Why? Z98.7 FM, the student-run radio station at Piedmont College, of course. Number four was Adobe Photoshop. This was used for the print advertisements. First, the research paper. I went through the re I went through the, um, both the history of mass media and the relationship, both in a chronological capacity of studying how mass media evolved, but also how history was taught through mass media. And this, of course, evolved over time. First, uh, first we have entertainment, and this is one the most common way we see history and mass media collide with one another. But what do I mean by this? Uh, have you ever gone to the movies and seen a movie about, say, Alexander the Great or, or, or uh, Pompeii even? We have, we have entertainment movies that are mainly meant to entertain and, of course, to sell, but we also have, but, I'm sorry, but, but it also uses history as a set dressing. Next, information. This is a uh, form of co collision, if you will, that is much more focused on information, trying to educate the viewer, or the audience, rather. Th these are, uh, this is very prolific in ways one does not expect. It ranges from podcasts to documentaries to uh, as well as books. Next, the Mandela effect. This is a bit out of the blue, but I decided to also focus on a third, less talked about, um, Cohesion between mass media and, and history. This is when a, this is a phenomenon when mass media, through either a mistake or sometimes malice, uh, repeats a, a falsehood that is repeated ad nauseum to the point where it replaces the historical fact. An example being the sinking of the USS Maine. 
we all um, we all believe that, or we all taught that uh, Spain had fired on the on the USS Maine. When in reality, no naval inquiry had ever found that Spain acted with malice, and that this was likely a result of an accident. In my second deliverable, I made a promotional package. The most interesting promotional packages to me were was the radio advertisement and the print advertisement. The print advertisement, I took inspiration from old propaganda posters with old letters where it mattered. Attend this panel, historically inaccurate. I decided that for colors that I would start off with yellow text on a red background to try and draw the eye, but I was told that the printers wouldn't work with that, with that color scheme, so I changed it to white text on a dark blue background. Next, for, radio, for the radio advertisement, I had a little more fun in that I created one, and I created a 30-second radio advertisement that not only went forward chronologically with the music, but also with tempo. I'll let you hear that right now. Hey there, Piedmont. Do you like history? What about books, radio, movies, and TV? Well, JJ Susanna will be hosting a panel with professors to discuss history and media. It will be an interesting discussion with Professor Gablehausen, Professor Franklin, and Professor Jackson. We'll talk about ancient history, cowboys, and even how media has had a direct impact on history itself, followed by a QA section. It will all be there on October the 8th, 4 p.m., Swanson Center Screen Room. Once again, that's Swanson Center Screen Room at 4 p.m. on October the 8th. So, of course, as we heard that, it started off with a very ancient tone from ancient Greece. Then it moved forward into the medieval area, and we hear a modern rendition of a Latin drinking song called In Taverna. And then we and then we progress forward into the Hollywoodized Old West. Next, we have the 30-second video advertisement that I created for the panel. Hey there, Piedmont. Do you like history? What about books, movies, TV, and radio? Well, J.J. Sassano is going to be hosting a panel all about that, about how history and the media have had a pretty significant relationship with one another. It'll be an interesting discussion featuring the likes of Professor Gablehouse and Professor Franklin and Professor Jackson. It'll all be there on October the 8th, 4 p.m., Swanson Center Screen Room. Once again, that's Swanson Center Screen Room at 4 p.m. Next, the Roar articles. I was tasked with creating a series of eight Roar articles, and I will now go in detail about how I created two of them. First of all, they are a common historical misconception that we, that we often hear. And this was about how Nero and he allegedly fiddled while Rome burned. The fiddle was not invented at this point. He would have used a lyre, which was a much more common string instrument. But Tacitus, who lived after Nero, wrote that Nero wasn't even in Rome when the fire broke out. In fact, now one, one might assume, well, didn't he have agents set the fire up for him? I wouldn't put it, put it up to that, as though while he did profit from the fire by building a new palace on top of the ashes, he also allowed people who lost their homes in the fire to live in his other palaces and even went so far as to import food for them so they wouldn't even starve. And lastly, we, we must focus on his persecution of the Christians in the aftermath of the fire. According to Tacitus, the Christians actively hindered the efforts of people trying to put out the fire, and in fact seemed to encourage its growth. This, was, this, was, this is believed by some to be the work of Christians who hoped to, who interpreted the fire as a sign of the Book of Revelation, the book of Revelations, and that this was a sign of the end times. Of course, Christianity was very new, and they assumed that the end times were right around the corner. We, of course, know that wasn't the case. And if you say you're near and this is the first time you hear about the Christians and they're letting the fire keep going, I think I'd be a, a little annoyed at this group, if you will, that they might have caused and even contributed to damage. Next, I would talk about a very common myth we get from the American Revolution regarding the role of the militias. During the, uh, the American Revolution, we of course know about the shot heard around the world, fired at, at the Battle of Lexington after Concord, of course. This was when the militias managed to successfully repel the Redcoats coming to take away their guns. Now, 
that while the militias did perform very well in this battle, they, they soon found themselves underperforming in the subsequent battles, especially when they were asked to take on the offensive. Often the militias companies were known to lack the proper discipline we see from regular troops and were even known to run away en route when, when under fire. This, was, this proved to be poor for the generals who relied on, their, on them as stopgap troops to try and get men in there while the more proper, uh, uh, all the more proper regiments moved into place. Sorry, sorry. This was not to mention how the militias had, uh, uh, were able to essentially siphon off vital manpower from the continental army. What do I mean by this? Well, the, the militias had, uh, they paid in state currency when at the time the continental army paid in national currency, which was two different things. Now, the Continental Congress had unfortunately all inflated their own currency and caused their paper money to become worthless, whereas state currency was much more valuable and backed up. So Washington could not pay his soldiers, whereas the soldiers in the militia companies had money. And lastly, I must... Uh, uh, next. next, I would like to focus on the development block. This was a series of 12 blog articles I had created for the for the final no, for the fourth capstone. Sorry. This was about my experience and how I approached the various deliverables I was tasked with making. You know, we have the latest article right here. This is about a retrospective, and in fact, if we, as we look over here, I can even comment on the, on, the, on these articles. And as you can see, it is on the page. On top of that, if you wish to contact yourself directly, there is a contact, uh, contact myself directly, there is a contact page where you can enter in your message and your email, and I will receive it directly in my inbox. And of course, there's an out, out about, and of course, a video. That is for the sixth deliverable, which I will get to. Now, if you would like to access this site yourself, you can type in bit.ly slash jsusano site, or simply search it on Google, which should uh, turn it up. JJ's development blog, that is. Next, a meeting of the minds. This was my fifth deliverable, which was a panel featuring three professors I had invited to, to this very room we are, we are sitting in to discuss their views on, this, on history and mass media and their various experiences. Um, for, to represent history itself, I brought along Professor Ryan Franklin to represent mass media. I, I brought along our very own Professor Melissa Jackson and to, and to represent the theater department and by extension, the entertainment department and the entertainment aspect, I brought along Professor William Gablehausen. They, these uh, Professor, uh, um, sorry, Professor Brian, uh, uh, Professor William Gablehausen. There we go. Had uh, has own experiences from a perspective of theater in theater as well as entertainment at large. They have a unique position known as a continuity director. Now, this individual is tasked with ensuring that things are correct, that the dress and the attire and the look of the scenes are all correct, and how in the way they are presented. For instance, uh, one, might, one might assume that some of the uniforms in Enemy at the Gates, which was in the image back in the Roar articles, might be a bit off in terms of uniform. It was actually correct in terms of uniform, but the movie did suffer from other inaccuracies. Next, I, next I, uh, we had Professor Melissa Jackson who spoke about from her own experiences as a documentarian. Now, um, a documentarian can produce a documentary with a very varying budget. And this can range from having to do everything yourself to being able to hire individuals to help you along the way. 
And for instance, if you have the money, you can probably hire someone to do the historical research for you and help make sure you get things right, your own continuity director, as it were. 